So obviously with the advent of the you know, so-called intellectual dark web and the idea that there are many public intellectuals, yourself included, that have been experiencing both heightened prominence and controversy uh, as we have kind of tried to wade into the culture wars and identity politics and all of the things that sort of have wrapped uh, the, the Western world around the axle lately. What is your sense both of why that is happening now, what are potentially some of the sort of evolutionary reasons for it, and then also, I mean, and then let's try and explore together, what's next? We are built for the various canonical obstacles that we face in evolutionary history, or we have faced. What we don't realize is that we carry many latent programs for alternative circumstances, programs that we may never encounter if the circumstances that they match never show up in our environment. I would argue that one of these is for periods of austerity, that in a period of economic contraction or its pre-economic uh, equivalent, people go into a phase that's very tribal and they start looking around and thinking, who's vulnerable? Who can't defend their stuff? And people can afford to be a lot nicer to each other when there's plenty to go around because of growth um, or its equivalent. But when that peters out, people start going after each other. And we're in a very confusing phase because one of the things that tells you that you're in an economic contraction is there's not enough food, and we don't face that situation. So in a sense, even though we are in a contraction, one of the signals that would cause people to go tribal has been suspended. But others are beginning to kick in, and there is a general sense in our culture that things are coming apart. And that sense that things are coming apart have people looking for a kind of higher ground that will involve tribalism and will involve uh, people doing things that violate the values they believe they hold, and I think that's what we're seeing. You either can move forward to kind of a more global perspective, like we are all connected in some way, um, or you can regress. So it's progress or regress back to ethnocentric tribalism. And obviously, as we teeter on this brink of saying, hey, the problems we face these days are no longer national. They don't stop at borders, whether it's refugees or climate or geopolitics or macroeconomics. They, they are complex, ambiguous, and, and transnational. Which it feels like we're being dragged into a global centric awareness, but it's also the transitional period. Uh, to just one more metaphor in the mix is a little bit like being a soft shell crab. You know, we've left the confining shell of nationalism and tribalism. We are absolutely vulnerable in this transition, and people are, uh, you know, there's not necessarily a clear voice of leadership to get us all through that transition and into the more expansive container of we are all in this together. So you have a lot of demagogues, right, and, and, and a lot of kind of so-called populism saying, come back into the old shells, you know, d divide rather than unite. And I would just add that one thing you can do once you realize that that pattern is there is recognize that where this ends is not good unless we intervene. So, in other words, this pattern of um, there's abundance, abundance leads to certain kinds of uh, willingness to interact, broad-mindedness, let's say, then there's contraction uh, and austerity, and that results in a kind of tribalism. This oscillation is going to kill us. Mm -hmm. the, solution to it <clears throat> the solution to it involves architecting a stable, a steady state that gives us the inputs of abundance in a way that does not oscillate between boom and bust. If you can create... So what, what does that even look like? <clears throat> it looks like a world in which people have enough, they have the sense that things are getting better because you've architected them to give people that sense of breadth. In other words, maybe you have shifted growth into a different mode. In other words, if everybody is freed to be generative, so you're constantly encountering new, interesting stuff, that feels like the world of abundance that happens when you've just discovered some concentrated source of growth. Mm -hmm. It may not be predicated on growth, and that's the point, is we're not in a position as human beings to track actual growth. So if we can substitute things that feel like growth, then we will put people into their growth mindset, as it were, mm -hmm and then they can afford and they will naturally be inclined to be decent to each other. What you're describing seems you know, beautiful, possible, but wildly ambitious and would take a hell of a long time if it worked at all. I mean, like, are you talking about like a fundamental retooling of socioeconomic 
structures and national stories and pervasive messaging and public sentiment all <coughs> to the point where people are like, oh yes, we can afford to be generous, we can afford to be kind, we can afford to be inclusive? I'm talking about a process that will take three generations at least. Okay, do we have that much time? Well, let's put it this way. You don't need to solve the entire problem at once. You need to forestall the existential threats. None of them can come to fruition uh, if this project is to work. So we have to wake up to those things that threaten us acutely, and we have to begin addressing them. That does not have to happen in exactly the same moment as people begin to feel uh, a steady state abundance. But you do have to give them a burst of abundance in order to relax the tribalism that is setting in. So the question is, how do we get enough people to have a post-global experience in order to annex global-centric perspective? And the only two options I can think of is either one, um, Independence Day level stuff, the discovery of other life, something that really w wakes us up to the fact that we are here together on this little blue marble. Um, and, that's, and that's the sort of, so it's the astronauts, <laughs> the, the others, the, you know, or some form of psychonauts, some form of expansion in consciousness that you could scale rapidly, relatively speaking, within the span of a generation that gives people a post-conventional global perspective in their interiors such that when we get back to start doing your longer, bigger, harder project, there are people who are actually holding that, that beat. There's several routes to the place you're talking about. None of them are easy, but they're relatively straightforward. One thing is the fact that we have become an existential threat to ourselves slots in very nicely to the enemy that we face together. Mm. Right? We've mm -hmm. seen the enemy, it is us. Oh. And so that awareness of that can, I believe, trigger the kind of unity that you're talking about. The problem is that narrative, which I believe is true, we have become the existential threat to ourselves, that narrative is in conflict with those who are most powerful in civilization who would like to keep it running as it is because it's feeding them pretty darn well. So that story, even though it should unify us, it happens that there are a few holdouts and they're the most powerful people and they're selling a different story. And also it feels like it requires a degree of radical self-assessment to say it is us, not to say it is them. Right. The natural tendency <laughs> is to see it as them, but it is really, it is us. It is the processes that, you know, somehow keep this room temperate, you know, they're fueled by some power station somewhere that has implications. So, you know, it is really us. It's the processes that we are depending on that we don't see day to day, but they're out there. Um, the other thing, and you know, and you, you point to it, uh, I think you called it the psychonaut route into that sort of unity involves an enlightenment, an awakening to a deep truth. And I, the analogy I use is this. If you discovered that you were a robot and that you were sent to, I don't know, assassinate some person who was innocent, if you discovered that that was the explanation for you, you would reject your program, right? You as the robot that had been given decency in order to get by everybody so you could commit your assassination would say, actually, I prioritize the values and I reject the mission that I've been sent on. That's who we are. We are that robot. We are on a genetic mission that is absolutely unacceptable. How would you just, how would you just succinctly define that genetic mission? That genetic mission is... Just propagation at all costs? Propagation of your particular genetic spellings. And here's the key. It's a little subtle, but if you and I have different spellings for a particular, let's say, a respiratory enzyme, and let's say that respiratory enzyme functions better in you than in me. It's 10% more efficient. My respiratory enzyme still wants your respiratory enzyme to go extinct because it doesn't care about the function. It cares that that spelling is advanced and your spelling is in conflict with my spelling. As long as yours is around, there will be fewer copies of mine. So our genomes are actually interested. I mean, the, if I can just be clear about it, the mind fuck of the whole thing <laughs> is that the entire evolutionary story is the cosmic spelling bee and it ends in genocide, right? Hmm. Once you realize that that's what you are, that you're built to advance your genetic spellings into the future generations, irrespective of what they spell, hmm. and that 
under circumstances like these, we can afford to be decent to each other, but if things were different, one of us would be putting the other in a gas chamber? No way. I want no part of that, and neither do you. So when people realize that that's really what they are, they are built to be nice when it makes sense to be nice, and they're built to be genocidal in circumstances when genocide is the thing, mm -hmm. then the question is, well, all of the things that you actually value, how consistent are they with being that robot on that mission? So it sounds like you are sort of saying, at our root, we are nasty, brutish, and short, <laughs> right? The, the, the old selfish gene kind of thing, compared to some ascensionist or triumphalist. Clearly, you know, it's very prevalent in the self-help popular psychology space. We are on the frothy edge of, of, of realizing our true natures as you know, spiritual beings, blah, blah, blah. Um, is that something you don't hold out hope for? You feel like at root, we are just self-oriented robot programs? Is what, what's, what's our shot at redemption? Do oh, we have one? I, it's easier. It's easier than you would think. Because the fact is, I'm telling you, we are that robot mm -hmm. on that mission. Once you know that that's your mission, you could just reject it. Right? I'm, not, I'm not putting anybody in a gas chamber. I just won't do it. Right? I don't care about the genetic spellings at all. And I really don't. If I discovered that my sons were switched in the hospital at birth and they were not actually related to me, it doesn't change my relationship to them. It doesn't affect whether I love them. I don't love them because of their genetic spellings. So my point is, we are actually, evolution screwed up. It handed us the tools to recognize that we don't have to value the game that it is playing and that we can now repurpose the hardware to something that's actually worthwhile. Hmm. And how liberating is that? I mean, who wants to walk around with bigotry? I mean, it's, it's funny because I mean, that was just in, in my next book, there's going to be a section, Evolution is Amoral. And, 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 no, and no sooner do you realize that, that you realize, oh, we are being nudged, pushed, and prodded into a whole lot of outcomes that create tons of pain in our psychosocial frameworks, our value sets, uh, that are 100% wins on the evolutionary level yep. and tragic for us. Right. And yeah. the, the crazy thing is freedom from that is as close as just recognizing what it is and then saying, well, I mean, I, I have a particular analogy I like. Um, there's this point at which uh, pilot, the pilot's name was Sully, I guess, Captain uh -huh. Sully, yeah. who landed the, the plane on the Hudson. There's a point at which the birds have struck the engines, and he needs to land the plane on the water. And there's a good chance that he's going to kill everybody on board, but their best chance that they're going to live is him, right? And he says, my aircraft, which is what you say when you take it away from the autopilot, right? You take responsibility for it. And the basic point is we need to look at evolution and we need to say, my aircraft, right? It's that simple.